Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, chapter 16, the great book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel in the Hebrew tongue meaning God strengthens you. There's no other strength that will last except that that comes from him. And as much as all wisdom also comes from him. In the 15th chapter, we found out um, the, the actual lesson B. When God creates something for a certain purpose, use it for that purpose, not something else. And he utilized the grapevine to say, hey, you can't put it, make a peg out of it and expect it to stand. It won't. It'll collapse and it'll let you down. People will do you the same way. God's people would do the same thing. And then we come to the 16th chapter where God looked and he saw Jerusalem, the city, the land of Judea. And this 16th chapter is written to Judea. You do not want to overlook that fact. Now, what it does, it utilizes her as a young uh, baby, born there an unclean birth, and then growing to maturity, and God placing his skirt over her, taking her to wife. And before this chapter ends, he will make an eternal covenant with this geographical location. Now, if you're sharp enough, you can also pick up on the history of Jerusalem right from the mouth of God in this 16th chapter. I will, I will point to it at times, but you can actually see the migrations, the takeovers, who was in control, and so forth. But ultimately, it will switch even to the prophecies concerning this city, making it a a fantastic uh, place. And he said, I, I, uh, I married you, I decked you out, and all you turned out to be was a whore. Okay. All you could do was whore around. And you didn't only take money for your whoredoms, you paid them to come to you. How unusual. But anyway, again, I, I want to warn you before we start now, this is written concerning a city, but it uses the analogy of a female, okay, as being God's favorite place on earth. So let's pick it up, if we may, then, with chapter 16, verse 26. And we continue God giving that instruction after she goes astray. Verse 26, and that word of wisdom from her father, and it reads, Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, that means lustful, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. And our father's not happy about it. Okay. Now, naturally, uh, in, in history, and I'll point to the history of this, every time the children of Israel from this area would get in trouble, instead of turning to God, they'd run to Egypt, run to Pharaoh, wanting help. And there God was all the time. His outreached arms of salvation for the taking. And they run to somebody else. He doesn't like it. He's jealous. Verse 27. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out mine hand over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. It's a sad situation when the heathen themselves become ashamed of what God's own children would do or what his own city would do. This, this place that had an unclean birth, but which originally she was called Jebus because the Jebusites formed her, established the city of Jerusalem, and then David taking her and making her the city of peace. And, and then... Um, she turns herself to the Kenites as well as other peoples <clears throat> because the Philistine means the migratory ones, the rolling ones. 28, thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians because thou wast unsatiable. Yea, 
Thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. You, you just couldn't um, get far away in enough idols and enough religions when you built a little brothel house with a cross on the front of it in every street and never would get around to teaching God's Word in that house, but you had to play the harlot. That is to say, teaching the traditions of men and making void the Word of God, quick like a bunny and a few other things on the high day of Christianity. Our Father doesn't like it. He said, you, you, you chase around with those traditions so much that nothing anymore will even satisfy you. Verse 29. Again, we're talking about a geographical location. Think about it. 29. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan, under the Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. You took in the magicians, the astrologers, the czars. You got a czar for every purpose, every religion, every way, every way but what it should be in God's book, God's word, or the teachings of Almighty God. Every You even have to try a little hallucinatory drugs at times to get a little uh, trip uh, and call that spiritual. Father's unhappy. He does not appreciate it. And naturally, Chaldea is Babel, and our Babel confusion. Verse 30, how weak is thine heart, or how filthy is your mind, saith the Lord God, seeing thou dost all these things, the work of an imperial, imperialist, uh, imperious, uh, whorish woman. It means zealous, brazen. A brazen woman about it. Um, our father just doesn't like it. And how unhappy he is with his own children. And yet he's always willing to forgive when you repent. Again, uh, I, I want to keep emphasizing, this gives you a history of Jerusalem from Babylon, from the Assyrian. You remember the Assyrians took captive the ten northern tribes? And then later, the Babylonians would capture the other two remaining tribes 200 years later, and they would go into captivity of the Chaldeas. There were five dialects in the Chaldean tongue. They seemed to enjoy all of them. Verse 31, In that thou buildest thine intimate place, that's to say your cat house, the brothel house being translated, in the head of every way, at the beginning of every street, and maketh thine high place, that's your place of worship in every street, and has not been as an harlot, in that thou scornest higher, you wouldn't even take pay, you paid them. In other words, he, he said, you are really confused. You're really in a bad way that, um, that you can't even, you, you don't even um, um, do it as, as a whore normally would. I want you to know, and I want you to remember the great book of Hosea in the Minor Prophets. Hosea in the Hebrew tongue means salvation. And, and God told Hosea, go marry a harlot. Okay. And, and he did. And then God named the children. And he gave them names. like They didn't know who their fathers were. So he named them Lord Ruhama in the Hebrew tongue, which means not pitied. And he called them Luami, which is to say, not my people, and because of the harlotry. And so this is plain. Our father is a jealous father. When he created the heavens and he created the earth and he created this beautiful place called Mount Zion, the land of Judea, his most favorite place, not only in the universe, not only the world, but in the universe even, his favorite place is Mount Zion. That's where, as it is written in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 24, he will set his eternal temple. Verse 32, But as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. In other words, um, you, you always would, you would prefer to have a false religion instead of studying my word. You would rather worship an idol or something false than you would my word. And it is amazing to me how
how many people they um, let me give you an example of this. I like to use it in this particular case. A lot of people say, well, how, how can that be? We have churches all over the place. Let me tell you, you know, when, when I say concerning uh, the book of Genesis that nowhere does it say Eve partook of an apple, do you know that droves of people will, well, I'll prove him wrong, because they've seen it as little children in Sunday school classes of Eve eating this apple, which is a lie. They lie to the children and then expect them to, to God to be happy with it. And they'll go to their King James Bible to prove me wrong that Eve did eat an apple. I've seen it. And they can't find it. You know why they can't find it? It's not there. Because she didn't eat an apple and then make a fig leaf mask to put over her mouth. She went to the fig grove, which means the hidden one, and made a fig leaf apron to cover her private parts. That's what she did. That's biblical. That's what you will find there. Verse 33 to continue. I'm telling you, the reason I use that as an example is that you can go to church sometimes, and I'm not judging. You can judge for yourself. But you're not going to study God's Word. You're going to hear maybe one verse and then pop in hot air for an hour. That doesn't gain you much. Well, it sounded good. Any psychologist can play one-upmanship, okay? But God's Word is God's Word, and there is no substitute. Verse 33. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers and hirest them that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredoms. Uh, I mean, you, you can't engage enough with enough people. You can't find enough. Verse 34, and the, con and the contrary is in these for, for, from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. And, and you know, this is one of the greatest mistakes of God's children. It was also of this nation. I'm talking about the land of Judea. You cannot buy friends. We've had it from Lynn Leith in, in, this, uh, in my generation. We've given away thousands, millions, and billions of dollars. And, and, and it is remarkable to help people that are really down and out. But to do it for buying friends, well, if we give them money, they won't fight us. That's a lie. You can't buy friends. You give them money, and they'll say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the next year, they'll say, you're late. They expect it, and they're sure not your friends. So, uh, and so it is. You cannot, you, you, um, you cannot give in to a peoples and expect them to respect you. You can't, you can't buy them. It's not dignified. Therefore, it doesn't work. That's what God is saying here. You cannot buy friends. 35, wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. In other words, you, you idolaters, you that worship other traditions and won't listen to me, you hear what God has to say. 36, thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered, Though thy whoredoms, through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy, abom thy abominations and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. They, they, they didn't even know who the father was because they were children of whoredoms. And, and there you have poor old Lord Rohama, not pitied and so forth. But God would change her name to Rohama, which is pitied. And, and God does love his children. But the children of that... Do you know what this word filthiness is in the Hebrew tongue? It, it is nekasath, which is copper. 
She didn't have silver and gold, precious uh, commodities for her ill-gotten gains. All she had was a bunch of brass. When, when you poured it out, that's all it was. And I, I don't know how it got to translated filthiness. It would seem that somebody was trying to dress it up a little bit for her because the word in the Hebrew means only one thing. It means copper or an alloy thereof like brass. All, all you had was a bunch of fake money and fakeness. Uh, verse 37, Behold, here's the answer, Therefore I will gather all thy lovers, your allies, with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all of them that thou hast loved, with all them that thou hast hated, I will even gather them round about against thee. And I want to repeat that, against thee. And will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. In other words, I'm going to strip it down to where it will all show. All your shortcomings. You know, uh, when this truly happens in prophecy is when Christ returns at the second advent. And you have a lot of people that are whoring after the false Christ. I mean, worshiping him, thinking he is Christ. Why? Because the so-called Christian preachers, many of them told them he was Christ. And they run to him. But when the real Christ returns and they realize they've been in the bed with Satan, they pray for the mountains to fall on them. They are so ashamed they don't even want to face the true Christ. They just want to be disappeared. They want, they want to die. But thank goodness our Father does love the children, and we have the millennium. But you can see all that entailed within this great chapter. That will come to pass. Only your righteous acts of serving God weaves the fine linen you will wear at that time. Other time, you otherwise you will be naked. You will not have clothing from the traditions of men. You would be naked. Verse 38. You want documentation for that? It's Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. Okay. Because your, the fine linen you wear is woven together from your righteous acts. If you don't have any righteous acts over and around, guess what you're wearing? 38. And I will judge thee. Thank goodness it is God that judges, not man. I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged, and I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. It's not going to be a pretty time. 39. And that's when they will pray for the mountains to fall on them. Revelation chapter 9. And I will also give thee into their hand, and they shall throw down thine imminent place. They're going to tear down your cat houses, your brothel houses and shall break down thy high places. Those places you try to worship and say it's God's house. And God's word is never taught there, really. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. And so it is. Well, well how could that be? How could, how, could, how could they take even a nation like ours and strip us bare? It couldn't take very long. You start paying $800 billion a year to foreigners that don't like you for black gold, oil, or if you start borrowing money from a communist nation, like maybe a trillion dollars. Do you know how much the interest stacks up on that kind of stuff? You, th you think, well, stripped bare. Do you think we've been stripped bare? <laughs> what do you want to call it? And, and it continues. And then Isaiah chapter 3, verse uh, 8 comes to, to mind. Or 4, rather. Chapter 3, verse 4 through 8. And our rulers are like little children. They can't rule. And there must come a, a day of reckoning. But prophecy always comes to pass as it's written. We're about to be stripped past recovery, but we shall recover. Why? It's written. Verse 40. 
They shall also bring up a company against thee. That's military. And they shall stone thee with stones and thrust thee through with their swords. Our truth overpowers that. God always leaves that remnant, that the remnant will bring that truth forth. And truth will abound. And truth does have the victory. Why? God wins. It's written, and it always comes to pass exactly as it is written. Have you read it? Verse 41, And they shall burn thine house with fire, and execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women. And I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou shalt Thou also shall give no hire any more. I'm going to put a stop to it. Well, well, when does he do that? Second advent, of course. I told you about it before. When Christ returns, that'll end it. He will not put up with it. There's going to be some changes, and I do mean final changes. Verse 42, So will I make my fury toward thee to rest. And my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet. I'll reclaim is what it means, and will be no more angry. And actually, that's the seventh trump when Christ returns and the millennium begins, and teaching with Satan locked away, and teaching begins. There'll be no whoredoms at that time. 43, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but has fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I also will recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God, and thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. Uh, I'm not going to let it go on. I'm going to put a stop to it. And our Father does. In the millennium, guess, guess who kind of hands out the discipline to make sure it doesn't happen? God's elect. For as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, you're, they are priests for a thousand years with Christ, and they keep discipline. Verse 44, Behold, Every one that useth proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. What has been shall happen again. It seems like our people never learn. But again, I want to emphasize, we're talking about a geographical location, and if you do not keep that hooked in, it is true that there are types with, that happen with our people. But the geographical location is important that you keep that tight, for it is the barometer of the end times. Every mo movement there indicates prophecy of the end times, that it happens there in that uh, special place that God so loves. 45, thou art thy mother's daughter. Thou loatheth her, that loatheth her husband and her children doesn't know who they belong to. And thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loatheth their husband and their children. Your mother was an Hittite, and your father an Amorite. And, of course, this, is, this would be the Jebusites that form Jerusalem. But also, what does it mean otherwise? It means that even God's own children, they don't know who they are. Most of them make the sad mistake of calling themselves Gentile. When the, when the ten tribes were taken captive over the Caucasus Islands, were, uh, mountains rather, were later called Caucasians. Are you a Caucasian? Then you're not a Gentile. The Caucasians then would later settle Europe. They would migrate to Canada and America. And that's why this great nation is so blessed today. Because God looks after his children, and where that remnant is that teaches the truth, it's always blessed. No one can prevent that. No one can uh, stand in the way of that. Well, how can you be so sure? It is written, have you read it? Verse 46, And thine elder sister is Samaria. She and her daughters, they that dwell 
at thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Do you understand that Sodom would even apologize to some of the things that happen today? They really would. And Christ predicted that would come to pass. And so it is, uh, the lesser of the two. You want to remember that the ten tribes, their capital was Samaria, where, uh, under, uh, unfortunately, Jehos- the, um, the, uh, uh, the Israelite king, uh, Jeroboam, whom, of many people, made him make a golden calf and worship it, instead of worship, going down to Jerusalem to worship God. 47, yet hast thou not walked after their ways? He said the same thing. Nor done after their abominations, but as if that were a very little thing. I, I, I want you to know the word thing here is in italics. It means it was added. The word should be time. A very little time thou was corrupted more than they in all your ways. In other words, it didn't take long. Swacko, you walked right into it. It's a sad thing when people happen to not even know who their father is. And I'm talking about the migrations of the children of Israel in the house of Judah. That after all these years and with all the signs and all the scripture that identifies them, that they're still orphans in many cases and cannot claim their heritage because they don't know who they are. Well, who's responsible for that? Like mother, like daughter, like father, like son, over and over and over, and so it goes, except for the remnant that keeps the truth coming down through that silver thread of truth that is God's Word. And how precious it is. Let's go with the next verse, please. 48. As I live, this is God swearing. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, thy sister hath not done, nor she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Now, that's... um, it's no wonder our father is jealous. It's no wonder he's disappointed. Well, what did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He destroyed them. And and when you have perversion that runs amok, don't worry, it gets his attention. And he'll see to it. When he hears the cries of the little ones that are offended, it brings him down. Verse 49, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. She had too too wealthy, too much time on her hand trying to find new things to do. That's what brought her to what she was. Fifty. And they were haughty. They, they bragged about it. They were proud. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. I destroyed the whole bunch. I mean, what a story it was that that he, he brought out, Abraham's nephew and his two daughters. It's all that was saved out of the whole bunch. Even, even, um, The nephew's wife, when she turned and looked back, when Lot's wife looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt while she was at the bend of the salt salt sea. Uh, And and naturally, anything that holds still there crests over with salt and crests it. But God killed her because she looked back. She wanted to go back to the perversion People play dangerous games in this generation. Our Father's watching. It isn't man that judges. You know, they really, they're always so afraid people will judge um, perversion. It's God that does. You don't have to worry. He pays very close attention. He destroyed them. Verse 51. Neither has Samaria committed half of thy sins 
She's not half as guilty. But thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. And naturally, this looks forward to the time that Antichrist will actually stand in God's own wedded place. As it is written, as I in the last lecture, I warned you or instructed you, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse four through six. Satan, the son of perdition, stands in this place that God so loves and claims to be God. There's no great mystery in that. It is written. Have you read it? Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses four through six. You might want to go ahead and read the ninth verse, too. If you want to believe the lie that's put out in these cat houses, brothel houses, where they teach traditions of men rather than God's Word, and I'm not judging, that's a fact, it's scriptural, then uh, God says He'll help you out in being delusioned. He'll send you delusion or allow it, that being an idiom, 52 to continue. Thou also which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they, that they are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame in that thou hast justified thy sisters. Uh, you want to be real careful. You prove your sister more, um, that they're more righteous than the people. Of, when it comes down to the fact that people would have to say that the Sodom and, Gar was, Sodom and Gomorrah was more righteous than people are today, what would be going on? It would not be good. But then, have you ever looked around you? Have you ever checked out some of the things that are transpiring in this nation? You want to wake up. You want to understand why Father says, You're fretting me. Because people are. He's not a happy camper. And guess what? He's coming back. And he'll take care of business. He'll put a stop to it. It's his promise. We read it back in the 42nd verse. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?